This is State Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. It is Thursday afternoon, folks. Ted Rolfson here in our studio, downtown Honolulu, Think Tech Studios, with our show, Where the Drone Leads. And often, you'll see on this table, uh, you'll see a rotorcraft of some kind. You might see a fixed-wing aircraft. Today, you see something that is neither and is both. And with it, we have also with us uh, Josh Levy. Josh, thanks for coming on the show. Josh is the coordinator of unmanned systems in the Applied Research Labs at the University of Hawaii. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about this very unique uh, table spanning drone you've got here, Josh. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, how it got here and what it's all about. Um, yes, yeah, so it's actually it's a pretty fun story. So I, I, I could go back a long ways with this thing, but well, I guess the fun part. So the, the the fun part is is the family tie and the kind of ah. very you know family oriented connection that I have with this aircraft. So uh, my brother works for a drone company over in in LA called Flywave Aerospace, and um, so they actually. They built this drone, and he, he physically built this drone himself. And he also physically came out and delivered it to us last week. And so you were out there at the airfield with personal us. Personal service. When, yeah, exactly. Personal yep. service, door Dan, to door. Dan, thanks a lot, Dan. We got a <laughs> yeah. oh, shout out to Dan. Yeah, thanks, Dan. And yeah, so. That's some of your older brother, Dan, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> older. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so you, so you saw it when we came and opened it up, and he gave us a, a great tutorial um, that was very simple, very easy to use, kind of. A quick checklist of, of how to set this thing up, and so, but the reason why this aircraft is so important, as Ted was saying in the beginning, is you know it's not a quad rotor, it's not a fixed wing, it's both, and so in that way it can do all the things that both of those types of aircraft can do, essentially at the same time using one one aircraft. So we're sitting at actually a traditional break in the technology from what we had in the past of just fixed wing or just rotorcraft, and something that combines the benefits and values of both, mm -hmm. and has optimize in such a way that you, the user gets out of it more of what he asked either one of them for. And exactly. so we have a hybrid basically here. This is a combination. And hybridization, to my understanding, took place in the mind of a guy named Dr. Trent Okazik uh, at FlightWave. Uh, he was affected by trying to do some uh, coral reef sampling in the Pacific Islands. Didn't have enough flight time on his quad rotors and was frustrated by that. He knew that wingborne lift is five or six times, this one probably eight times more efficient than rotor-borne lift. And so, in his mind, hybridization occurred. Probably not GMO hybridization, but <laughs> plain old mechanical hybridization. Yeah. So Trent has put together the vertical lift functionality and, and easy sky access and return of a rotorcraft, but the high performance of a fixed wing. Yeah, so just to, just to capitalize on that, so when we're out at, a, at our friend's house off of Cahava, you know how he has that property right on the beach there, that has... Um, that would be Craig Kaha'olupua. Exactly. Thanks, Craig. Shout Craig. out to Craig. Shout out to Craig. Um, so, you know, on that property, he has their telephone poles between him and the ocean, and then there's a house on the other side, right? So you can't take off with a fixed wing there at all. You're going to run into some serious problems. But we were able to take off and land in a small area and go fly a large area of reef and come back and land without without any chance of hitting anything, pretty much. So. so you're not compromised in terms of operations anymore with this kind of a configuration. Exactly. You have the same, same footprint as the DJI product as an Inspire, the Matrices, very similar for, uh, you know, landing, landing pad footprint. And since this particular aircraft has in its DNA some testing on Lanai and testing on Maui and on Oahu prior to its current configuration, the concept of high winds and high turbulence, which we deal with all the time out here, is built into the design. Exactly, yep. That's yeah, very stable in high winds, can sustain around 40 knot wind conditions, and still be able to operate. Mm -hmm. And so looking at this thing from an aerodynamic perspective, uh, as, as, as Trent would have done, he's put in here more aspect ratio than even a sailplane has in some cases, so a very low drag and, and very long endurance, and certainly a lot of uh, brute power here in the vertical lift function, which we thank I.M. Bore for helping a little bit with that out in Kailua. Yep. And so there's a lot of local knowledge in this, a lot of local experience uh, built into this particular aircraft. And now it's at UH. Yep. And we're probably the first uh, university user of this particular configuration or configurations like it. Yeah, I think so. I mean, so as, as you know, there are other hybrid systems out there, but none are, none are quite as effective as, as this, especially based on, on my experience and other people's and UH's experience mm -hmm. with, other, with other VTOL systems. Mm -hmm. And this one is, is a complex aerodynamic system but it's been made simple to operate, about as simple as you can possibly make it to operate. Exactly, and that, that was the issue with some of those other hybrids, that they were just too hard to fly, so people just 
kept them in the box, got them dusty, and that was all they all mm -hmm. they wrote. But I mean, me as a you know, I, I've had a lot of experience operating multi rotors, you know, quads and that kind of stuff. But I'd never flown fixed wings before. Um, but when I started flying this, I was really surprised at how easy it was to to move around, to operate, and then also most most importantly, transition from the from the multi rotor into the fixed wing and, and back in to multi rotor again into those different modes. I think that has a lot to do with how Trent's approached this from a design perspective, because uh, the complexity of making that transition from uh, wing borne to propeller borne or vice versa. Uh, can't be something that the operator has going to have to think through. It's got to be something baked into the design, baked into the, the flight management system so that it's relatively straightforward. At a certain speed, it transitions, end of issue. Exactly. And uh, that's, that's what we've seen here, and um, hats off to the designers, Trent and his team, for making that possible. Yep. So what we're also seeing, however, I believe, is a transition away from the, the, the popular quad rotor configuration, which will remain popular in um, entertainment and, and uh, uh, in the, in the, in the, uh, kind in of the hobbyist, hobbyist domain, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Getting to something like this, we're talking about a sort of a professional level of operations. So you wouldn't want to, even though, even, even though the systems have been simplified to the point that it fairly well takes care of itself transition-wise and such, there's still enough to consider here that you don't want to do it on a casual basis. Exactly, yeah. And so, you know, this this thing was designed for operations, op, you know, conducted by Coast Guard, um, various other Navy boat, kind of boat operations where you're needing the endurance of a fixed wing but have only the capacity to land and take off with with a quad rotor or vertical mm -hmm. takeoff and landing, so. And so we're, we're in that transition zone, past that transition zone, into the commercial or the professional operations area. In fact, you, you made an interesting point. I think Trent was out here a couple of years ago and we had a ship side demo down at, uh, with the Polar Star down mm -hmm. in Pier 11. And the captain of the Polar Star said, I want this to operate at five years on my boat and 40 knots winds. I want to be able, to, as a Polar Star was a Coast Guard icebreaker. Yep. I want to be able to fly out ahead and figure out where the ice is thick and thin and what the, what the digital elevation model of the ice is and the structural bearing strength of it so I can figure where to push through it. So something like this would be a great asset. So, that then brings up the point of the recording device, the camera, or the other sensors on it, and the software that's tied to that. So speak to that for a little bit, Josh, how we're gonna go forward in the world of the types of sensors that go on here, and the software that does the analysis from those sensors. Right, and so, so that's still a little bit in the, in the developing phase, especially with this aircraft, but, but the guys at Flywave have, have definitely, definitely know what kind of um, trajectory that they wanna take with this, and so what they've been doing um, is creating these adaptable nose cones, where essentially you can swap payloads out, essentially by just taking off the nose cone and replacing it with another one with a different sensor or different other payload type. And essentially just plugging it back in and then going off onto your next mission, so. We got plug and play payloads that are balanced to keep the center of gravity where it has to be, and the electrical connections are made so there's no, like untouched by human hands other than turning it to get it on and off. Exactly, and, and based on the configuration, the, the aircraft should the aircraft that is speaking to the ground control station should understand what the payload is, um, and then what kind of various missions are capable with those payloads. So whether it's mapping, whether it's search and rescue, um, whether it's something else in between, um, you, you, can, you can be able to do that with relatively little changing on, 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 the, on the manual side. You know, that brings up another point that to me is most interesting. We had an experience last week, and we're gonna have it again this week with uh, that grounded vessel off Waikiki. Mm -hmm. And the means by which you actually fly a mission to collect in information, either uh, by conventional cameras or infrared or whatever it might be, that has to be properly structured, consistent with the objective of the user who's gonna get the information back. If that information is a software package that does a certain kind of analysis, then the collection has to be structured in, in kind with how the software works. So we're making that step into a more complex operational and analysis domain as well, which is interesting because the pictures that are taken to go on the TV news, which show general scenes and general perspectives of what's going on, aren't necessarily useful or usable in the analytical world where you want to know, is that ship damaged more? Do we have, a, is there a change in configuration? Is the hull twisting? How about the coral reef? Is there damage on the reef? How about the sedimentation from the crushed coral? Where's all that going? Uh, that type of, of question and the answers associated that are necessary to answer it aren't going to come from just casual flitting about with it in the drone. Exactly. Yeah, so. it's not going to be the pilot that's going to be making those decisions. We have to be working uh -huh. with those yeah. end users to see what they need 
that we can then go collect data that they're going to be using to make decisions. So end user plus the software that's going to be used to, anal to generate their answers, that then is going to have to determine what the flight path is and the, actually the sensor mechanism itself. Exactly. So we work backwards from the desired end state, figure out what the steps are to get there. Mm -hmm. No longer just going out there and flying something and seeing what we got. Yep. So, Becoming a method, methodological, yeah. method, methodological. And this all yeah. leads to the fact that you're our single guy doing this. You're our single <laughs> point of failure, Josh. And, and, Hopefully and, that's not going to last forever. <laughs> well, that means we need to either clone you or we need to put an educational system and a training system in that has people start to recognize this. I think the training that we've seen today is principally, principally associated with getting a 107 certificate, a, a pilot certificate. And that has almost nothing to do with how you want to use it and the very discussion we're having. So, I, And this is, this is for all people involved in education, a structured, end-user-oriented, framed, progressive way to teach this, this complicated process is, uh, I, th I think, is your obligation, as I recall from your job assignment. I think uh, you're right. <laughs> okay. I think you're so, right. <laughs> so you are getting in your own way. You're the, you're, the fact that you haven't done that has made it impossible to replace you at this point in time. Exactly. I'm, okay. Yeah, too busy flying. Too busy flying these things and doing the work to actually put the program together to instruct <laughs> others to follow on behind you. I know, slowly. Yeah. I think we're definitely making progress. I mean, there are definitely, there's a lot of interest, especially here in the, at the community college level mm -hmm. and even at UH mm -hmm. as well, um, to, to get this stuff up and running. And so we're slowly going to be turning that cog that's you know pretty heavy, has a lot of momentum. So. It takes some energy to move it. What's really interesting, again, to me, a lot of things are interesting to me, but uh, we see there's a step in technology that suddenly inspires a new whole new level of capability, which requires the perception and the training, and that runs along for a while. Then there'll be another step in technology, and that'll move along. But this very configuration here, a hybrid configuration, so opens the envelope of utility for this kind of uh, system that it, it really it really pushes it. The technology is here. Now we have to work on the other side of it, the, the training, applications correct. and the training. Mm -hmm. And then and every time the analytical software uh, goes from the, uh, the professional package to the free package, uh, suddenly it gets broadcast to a wider audience, and now we have a new level of capability on the analysis side. And that'll then turn into back into the equipment and define a new requirement for equipment. So we have this cycle that's going to be jumping around as we go forward here. Yep, and it's going to yeah. make it really interesting. Too, so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, again, uh, this is uh, a, a totally interesting point. Right here on the show, we're having this transition both in the analysis part and in the configuration part. And it's even properly configured and colored for Halloween, being orange <laughs> and, and, and black. Yep. So what a triple point has, has acquired here, or arrived here, thanks to Trent and I am and uh, Phil McGilvery and others who were involved in this whole chain. So we'll come back and talk about where this future is going right after we get back from our break. Cool. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. We have this crazy thing going on today. I was just walking by and all these DJs and producers are set up all around the city. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? They told me they were making music. So I do it. You can be the greatest, you can be the best, you can be the king come banging on your chest, you can beat the world, you can beat the war, you could touch a black gold banging on his door, you can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock, you can move a mountain, you can break rocks, you can be a master, don't wait for luck, dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. It is still the noon hour, folks. Ted Ralston here and Josh Levy uh, at our studio downtown Honolulu Think Tech Studio with our show Where the Drone Leads. And we're talking about the drone taking us in a direction of hybridization. 
Uh, Josh Levy again, who is the coordinator of unmanned air systems uh, drones at, at UH. Josh, welcome on board again with your incredible find here, which is completely filling the table. Ray, we're going to need a new table, uh, <laughs> I think, in the future here on the show. But nice to have it at the beach here in Kailua. Or are we in Waimanalo today? I'm not quite sure. It looks it's like Waimanalo, Waimanalo to me. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we're talking about this very incredible transition point in terms of a, a drone configuration from just a rotorcraft or just a fixed wing with their own mindsets and mentalities to something that combines the two of them. And suddenly the world is open in terms of the range of missions and, and functions that can be performed by something like this. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what might be coming right around the corner here in terms of supporting our customers in Coast Guard, Pacific Command, and uh, even the Department of Emergency Management here in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there we, have, we have a lot of projects coming up. Um, and so one, one of which is the uh, that fishing vessel grounding mm -hmm. that uh, occurred off of Waikiki. So uh, the Coast Guard is very interested in, in looking into um, using UAS to understand a little bit more about the condition of the vessel, condition of the reef, all that kind of stuff that we spoke about previously. Um, and then something else that we're looking into is developing a um, kind of a, a mission for aircraft, surface, and underwater vehicles to be operating all, all autonomously to help uh, kind of solve some kind of a problem. So, you know, in, in terms of the um, emergency management section and, uh, you know, severe weather that, uh, that, the US, that the U.S. has been getting recently, that's a pretty hot topic. That's, that's a good point. Uh, certainly the uh, uh, global uh, sea level rise and global warming is generating all kinds of storm energy and such in the Pacific and uh, uh, a lot of inundation, a lot of islands that are being they're gone, and that means populations are going to get displaced. They're going to get pressured anyway and displaced. Agriculture gets displaced. Cultural issues get threatened. Structural issues like, uh, like ship uh, moorings and such like that are going to become uh, challenged. Mm -hmm. So we need to collect information about that. And we need, but you can't necessarily put a person at risk to go collect it, and you may not even have the right perspective from a person in a boat or at low altitude or a person in an airplane at 10,000 feet. So something like a, a drone fits right in the middle here. Exactly. And can provide superb collection. Mm -hmm. Yep, so if, if we want to sort of the pictures that we put up, um, so I'm just, just showing you some of the imagery that we collected um, just a couple of days ago. Okay. Um, Looking, looking out from, from, from Craig's house, actually doing some, doing some test flights out there. Um, if we keep going a little bit, we'll see. Aha, yeah, okay, there that's actually exactly the, what we're talking about. Okay, exactly. here we have the effects of you know, sea, sea coast erosion on Kamehameha Highway in Ka'ala. And um, this perspective gives you a way to look at the landform or the ability of that, of that land slope to hold on to itself or vice versa to, to the city and county to come in and do something to reinforce that road. Exactly. So this, Perspective gives you incredible information you can't otherwise get. Yep. And so yeah, looking from above. So that's actually the the the, in, the initial image. Um, the, okay. the one that we saw previously was just zoomed in. I, I managed to find it in the in the bottom right hand corner. So here um, we could look after a tidal wave or something or a tsunami. You could look at any uh, any bottom surface uh, adjustment that made as a as a result of the wave washing ashore in terms of access, in terms of uh, 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 stuff in the water, obstructions, or any, any, even any pollutants that might be entering in from some uncovered landside source. Exactly, and so that requires you know, more than just having an aircraft collecting all this data, right? So we're going to have to have essentially a, a swarm of vehicles, of, of autonomous vehicles, air, surface, and underwater to be able to collect a, a full picture of what's going on environmentally mm -hmm. during these situations. Then you've got to pull that information together and have it uh, deconflicted and correlated and time-snapped and all these things that turn into something that somebody can use and that brings up an amazing um, observation here. Once we start depending on systems like this and the analysis they produce, now we have a reliability requirement for the vehicles and the software systems to operate that way and operate that way consistently uh, in the weather uh, in, uh, as they age and this sort of thing. So there's a design requirement that comes in from a function and reliability perspective driven by the dependence that we as the public put on these systems. Exactly, and especially as we're going to be using these systems more and more, right? I mean, not just us doing the single mm -hmm. mission, but us, us as, a, as a society, right? Just depending on, on all these autonomous cars, all that kind of stuff, we, there's this level of reliability that they just don't have yet. And, and that's the sort of thing that, uh, that engineering gets into pretty well, but uh, it doesn't require a, a large footprint like a, a, a Boeing factory or something like that next door. That kind of engineering can be done in the lab. So it, in terms of a 
occupation for people in Hawaii, where we don't have large uh, aerospace facilities, that's an aerospace function that could occur here. Exactly. That is the determination of analysis methods, the software, the analysis itself, uh, software as a service. All those things are potential future careers for folks here in Hawaii after we graduate them through your course, <laughs> once you build your course. Which, I, which will happen at some point. <laughs> okay, yeah. all right, and, uh, <laughs> and on we go. So once again, we're at a, and just I, I keep repeating it here, but we're at a, actually quite a transition point here. This kind of technology available to us is gonna so change the, the landscape of the future and push on issues such as collection, such as the software analytics and such. And then actually that will, that will also turn to the incident command system where information is ingested and decisions are made and we'll have to figure out how to pull this new form of complex information into that system so people can make decisions at the right time and with the assurance that the information being used is correct. Yep, exactly. So nothing like exercises to uh, find that out. <laughs> and I think every time we've done an exercise, which is probably 10 of them in the last year or so, we always find out something very elementary or simple that we could have thought of, but it didn't really show up until you tried the exercise. Yep, that's uh, what testing's all about, right? And there you go, and so we're gonna try that next week. We will. Uh, want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So, um, so essentially what we're going to be trying to do here is uh, taking a page out of U University of Porto's book. Where That's Porto in Portugal. Portugal. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, where they're, they're already doing a pretty amazing job connecting uh, aircraft service and underwater vehicles to conduct operations. So what we're trying to do out here is have our own, uh, create our own rapid environmental picture. Rapid um, Environmental Picture, R -E -P, which rap means we're going to collect information about the environment consistently, commonly, and rapidly, and form a new picture that we haven't otherwise seen. Yeah, correct. To, to make some kind of decisions for whether it's emergency management after a big storm or some other, other um, environmental location that we don't really have that much information about, to rapidly go and collect that so we can then go... Um, do whatever we need to do in that area. That and the environment doesn't necessarily refer to the, the science of uh, invasive species necessarily, which you often think of as environment, but this means what's the, what's the topographical environment? What's the access look like? What do, what do the water sources look like? What about health issues in terms of a polluted well or something like that? So anything that is in the environment, whatever it may be, is subject to being, to, to, be, to be understood or needs to be understood in order to put the right picture together so that reaction can occur. So we're going to, so why don't you describe that experiment that we're looking at next week? Sure. So um, we're hoping to uh, conduct some some test um, some test runs off of uh, working with with Bellows Air Force Base over in Waimanalo. Um They've been extremely um, kind of receptive with this idea and mm -hmm. actually pretty excited about seeing all this stuff come together, right? Because they, you know, they 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 want this data almost as much as we do. Um, they're, they're looking forward to seeing what, what we're going to be collecting with, with, um, with, this, with this aircraft. Um, a surface vehicle called a WAMV, which we decided today is a wave-adaptive modular vehicle. That's off to Zach yep. and his gang. Zach Trimble okay. at UH. Um, and then a, a small ROV with just an RGB camera. And so using all three of these aircraft um, simultaneously to collect different types of information about a certain area, we start piecing together a pretty interesting picture about the, you know, the, the terrestrial topography, the underwater bathymetry, um, and then also collecting water samples and other kinds of information that are going to help us understand a little bit more about our, our environment. And that's, that's again, uh, it's going to be a good test and a challenge of, of the system of bringing information from multiple sources that are, didn't ever necessarily work together before, together into a common picture. So the whole issue of expression and visualization and extraction they are the next phase of discovery and development that has to occur, promoted and pushed by the functionality and capability of something like this, mm -hmm. and its underwater equivalent, and its surface equivalent. So now we're going to get flooded with information, and so artificial intelligence, uh, virtual reality, a lot of modeling and simulation, those are the areas of development that, that this technology is going to push on. Exactly. So, yeah, so this, yeah, this is kind of that that first step in this whole situation, right? I mean, the, the big data problem and the, the AI, all that kind of stuff yeah. is, is still a really interesting task that people are working on. Um, now that we have the platforms to be able to collect that, that amount of data and that quality of data, is everything's going to start to move pretty quickly, I think. And so we're talking about, at, at the end of the day, we're talking about big data. Mm -hmm. These things are makers of, of the pieces that become big data. So I hope that Noah Hafner's watching this and is feeling guilty about uh, what he's going to have to perform in the future here. It's funny you should say that. So I, I got a text from, from, our, from our boss, Margaret Edwards, this morning with Noah CC saying, 
on average, how much data does a UAV collect during, <laughs> during an hour? So this is the exact situation that we're thinking okay. about right now. And, and converting that data into something useful mm -hmm. is, at the end of the day, what we have to think about. The data by itself doesn't mean much. Now, I'll just go through a quick analogy. Years and years ago, like way, way back when the Ice Age had just left and I was a uh, young engineer, <laughs> um, we had a, a, a new airplane called the MD-11 coming around, which was the first of Douglas's electronic airplanes. And I had to stage a dinner between the chief pilot and a bunch of engineers to see if I can get conversation going, because pilots think one way, engineers think another. And finally, at the right time in the dinner, it, it showed up, and uh, one of these young engineers said, oh, now we got all this electronic stuff coming to the cockpit. We can, we, can, we can paint the sky with data. How much data do you want? How, what kind of data can I get for you? And his chief pilot looked down at this young engineer and said, you know, I want to know just two things. Are the houses getting bigger? Which means I'm heading for a house. Right. Or are the houses getting smaller? That's all I care about. I don't care about your data. I want to know, am I at risk of hitting a house? That was, he, he was using that a bit uh, ex, uh, you know, from an expressive point of view, but that was the point he was making. Hey, data doesn't matter. What matters is, is there a risk here that I have to attend to? Right. So that's what we have to think, and we need to get NOAA going in that direction. Exactly, and, and that's, that ties right back into the end user needs, right? It's, exactly. Yeah, I don't yep. care how well this flies. I don't care how well the camera collects data. I don't care. Amen. How well. And they shouldn't care about that. That yep. shouldn't be their job to worry about that. That's, they should that's worry my about job, unfortunately. It. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's about the fourth job you define for yourself here, Josh. So. Exactly. Yep. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, well anyway, uh, this brings us to the conclusion of this exciting phase here. This, the, the, I guess we've concluded the transition phase. We're now in this new domain of unmanned air systems operations, and it's really exciting to see it here. Thanks to your special uh, uh, pursuit the last year or two, working with, uh, with uh, Trent and IAM and such and pushing it forward. I am out there, Trent, and others who've been helping uh, push this particular technology forward. This is gonna be a game changer, absolutely. And so Josh Levy, thanks for coming on. And uh, we'll get some air under this guy and go do some good work next week. For sure. Thanks a lot. Thanks.